Welcome back to a new episode of the I Have No Idea What I'm Doing podcast, a show that helps African women at the start of their entrepreneurship journey reach their business, money, and lifestyle goals faster. I'm your host, Paula Rogo, checking in from Nairobi. Today, I want to talk about the power of pivoting. That word has come up quite a bit this season, hasn't it? especially as it pertains to all the women I've talked to about their businesses and COVID-19. Each entrepreneur I've talked to has spoken about the need to pivot in order to keep business running. But what does pivoting in action actually look like? My guest on today's episode will give us some clarity around that. Now, you might know my guest, Susan Joroge, as a TV and radio personality, as well as a moderator and MC here in Nairobi, Kenya. She's the host of KTN Morning Show, Life and Style, and formerly of the Friday Foreplay show on Asylum Radio. But today we're talking to Susan about her new company, Sip Trip, which is an online drinks delivery company here in Nairobi. And guess what? She launched Sip Trip right in the middle of quarantine. And I'm not talking about July, August, when we had a better handle and an idea of what COVID was in our lives. No, she launched her company all the way in April, when we were all still quarantined, stuck at home. And basically, we weren't sure if the world was coming to an end. We had no idea what COVID-19 meant. I know you remember that crazy time. But as Susan will tell us, this new business was actually a quick pivot for her. You see, at the height of quarantine, her family had to shut down their restaurants, Jueke Tavern on Gong Road and Bourbon Bridge Lounge off Thika Road. But despite having shut down, they still had quite a bit of inventory at the restaurant, specifically liquor and alcohol inventory. So recognizing that Kenyans at home would still love to drink their liquor, Susan quickly launched Sip Trip in just five weeks. Yes, from idea to launch, it took exactly five weeks. I spoke to Susan back in May, just weeks after she had launched. So I think this interview perfectly captures that period of insecurity and unsuredness and general vulnerability that comes with launching something new. She really didn't know what she was doing, but was trying to figure it out. All of us who are entrepreneurs know what that feels like. You see, most of the women I've spoken to on this podcast, especially this season, are women who've, who have been in business for a number of years. So I appreciate Susan's vulnerability and her openness in talking to me about Sip Trip and those first few weeks of business and all the things that she learned. In this episode, we'll also talk about how she keeps things simple, how leaning on family helped her launch Sip Trip, how she chose to launch without a business plan, the art of the cold call, and finally, how Susan sees competition. We're jumping into the conversation when I asked Susan about how she went from an economics degree to working in the media to then launching Sip Trip. Here she is. Because I know you started, you studied economics in school. Yeah. So why switch over to to media and hosting in that way? Yeah. Um. When I was in school and I was studying economics, I chose that degree because I liked math and math made sense. And I had to pick a university degree. So when I read about economics, it sounded, you know, pretty, pretty solid. It was broad enough for me to know that I could work in a few industries once I came back home. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other thing was when I finished or going through the experience of university, I was like, well, I definitely do not want to work in a bank. I don't think I want to do investment banking. I don't think I want to be a teller. I don't think I want to, you know, advise people on their wealth. Yeah. So I was like, hmm, okay. 
But I ended up in public relations. So I was reading a lot about my various career options in my last year, and public relations sounded like the middle ground between the degree that I had done, but the kind of person that I was and the kind of work that I wanted to do. So when I worked in PR here in Nairobi, Mm -hmm. and it was a really good work experience, kind of crazy. If anybody knows the agency life, they just know it. You just all you do is work. But it was where I discovered I wanted to be in media. And then I started auditioning. um, And that was a very interesting process. I just realized how much I didn't know Mm. how much research I hadn't put into this job that I was telling myself I wanted, but I hadn't really understood what it would take. But I auditioned for about a year, and then I was really lucky to get KTN, and I had gotten Friday for play just slightly before that. So it all kind of happened together after many, many, many no's, but not that many, to be fair, because I feel like there's people who auditioned for much longer. So I know, yeah, I, know I was also lucky. Um, mm-hmm. And it helped that I'd come from PR because I knew some of the people that I was going to see when I was going to do screen tests. Um, and then you decide to launch Sip Trip. Why not tell us what Sip Trip is and why you decided to launch this particular company? Sip Trip is an online drinks um, delivery shop. And we, we deliver both alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks to your doorstep. We're currently only working within the Nairobi vicinity, but we deliver practically everywhere within Nairobi. Yes, I started Sip Trip because as a family, we run two restaurants. Um, and they're bars and restaurants because it's a bar inside. Yeah. Um, and we closed because of COVID-19, obviously, and everybody you know, avoiding social gatherings. So, of course, as a restaurant, we closed. Um, But then what happened was my mom and I were discussing the stock and what we're going to do, what is going to happen with these businesses, because obviously as COVID-19 has gone, just like everybody else, it's guesswork. Like, we didn't really know how long this is going to take. We didn't know what was going to happen because we're in the service Mm -hmm. industry. So when we're talking about the stocks, we started discussing the possibility of starting a drinks delivery. And I would mention one of the drinks delivery companies that's also my competitor, but we were big customers of them. It was so convenient when we were at home. If we felt like we were far from bars or we didn't want to go to our wines and spirits, we just call and the drinks can come straight home. Yes. So we were like, oh, we have the stock, which is really the hardest thing for people to figure out. Mm-hmm. What we need to figure out is, you know, maybe getting riders and how we'd want to do it and figure out our pricing and the logistics, basically, of running Sip Trip. And she asked me for names. Me and my boyfriend sat down and wrote down some names. And I think it was like a week or so and Sip Trip was born. It happened quite quickly because when you are doing a family business, but you are... It's just my parents and me and my brother. Decisions can be made quite quickly. Mm-hmm. And what is happening with COVID-19 is we're just all chilling. We're all together anyway. So it was very interesting for the business to start off quite fast. I was reading about businesses needing to be adaptable at this time. So I don't know. I'm trying to figure out how adaptable I can be. No, it's interesting because most people say, you know, business plan and, you know, figure all those things out. But I guess... It- it's, it's a new business, yes, but you've been in this business, I would say, um, at least yeah. in terms of um, this, the back end, right? Getting the stock, and um, which you said is the hardest part. And actually, why is that the hardest part? Um, I think it's usually about getting reliable suppliers, people that you trust. Um, there's also a worry of usually bad alcoholic products within mm. the Nairobi market where people feel like they're getting products that aren't legit. So mm. you can drink alcohol and get horribly sick because yeah. it's not actually the brand you thought you were consuming. Mm. Um, the other thing is just also making sure you have, you know, all the products that people want. Yeah. So some suppliers don't have all the different brands. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, there's people also who have agencies. So sometimes you have to you're working with ABL and Panoramic Card and all that, and that comes with its own drama. <laughs> but the most interesting thing, like you mentioned, having a business plan and all of that and everything. Now that's what I'm working on now and figuring mm-hmm. out how I want the business to go and what direction I want it to take. But if anyone here is listening and they think that they need all those things to start a business, but maybe you have a supplier and you have a customer, imagine just start. Like, 
I think sometimes having a business plan is critical. It is very important and you should have it before you start the business. But if you don't, mm-hmm. you have an idea and you have, you know, you have the know-how of how you can sell your first product. I say just do it and then get the plan as you go or some. So when did you actually close the restaurants and then when did Sip Trip actually start? So we closed in March. We, we actually closed right after the announcement that restaurants should close. Um, I think most restaurants were all trying to, you know, stay open-minded and follow all the precautions. But once the government of Kenya made the announcement, then we closed. So opening Sip Trip was, I would say, five weeks probably after restaurants were closing. So the fourth week is when we started thinking about the drinks delivery um, option and how we could do that. And we tried to figure out the logistics with that. And for us, I think the market research was consulting with our friends and family and other people within the restaurant business. And then also thinking of our customers and we have their contacts and we're like, okay, they're all home. So for people who'd want to have a drink, maybe they would be happy to have it from a brand that they already have a relationship with. And so is it a family business or is this your business within the family? I think I'll say it's my business within the family. I don't think I've necessarily always seen myself as going into business. But when the discussion came along, I realized I had an interest in wanting to manage something, but also wanting to grow something that I now realized, oh, we have restaurants, but these restaurants aren't they can't run despite everything going on in the country. I think what happened with COVID-19 is we realized, oh, like there is something called essential services and you could run an entire business and career not based on it. And if anything in the world like this ever happens again, you just have to close and sit and show. So I think for me, the main thing was I wanted to make it my own and see if I can have something that will always be able to run despite whatever is happening in the world. Is it watching your parents or watching your family with their businesses? Do you think you absorbed some of that business savvy, I guess? I think so. I think I was raised by two business people, but they weren't always business people like when I was younger. Um, And the thing that I experienced actually in business was when I first worked with my parents after university. I think it was a very enlightening experience. I actually, that's when I was like, oh, maybe I'm not a business person because I would work with my parents. And then when you go home or it's the weekend or somewhere else, it's not work. We're just talking about work. Work is always coming up. It's just like all we discuss. And I was just like, no, I'm not in the office with you right now. I don't know why we're doing this. This is all the time. And I was just like, am I not a business person just because I'm not like that? Because for them, it's no qualms, no problem. They talk about business anytime, anywhere, and it works for them. Um, for me, it was just like, no, no, we need, we need some boundaries or so. But then what I also realized was maybe perhaps I worked with them when I was too young or I wasn't, I didn't understand work yet. Cause when I removed myself from that situation and wasn't working for my parents and working for somebody else, I realized work is still pretty engrossing. Yes. And you still have to set boundaries even when it's not somebody who's your family. So now with Sip Trip, I think it was also the type of business one. And then also now I have, I guess, maybe the need or want for that additional income and actually seeing like, I, I want to explain this properly. I feel like it's not clear. It's not coming out, out of my mouth no. as clearly as no, you're making head. sense. You're making sense. It's, 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 it's I'm making sense. Sure. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's maturity in one aspect and also just general knowledge in another. And then it's another thing to also now, this is your idea. This is your business. And, right. you, and you bring a certain, you know, expertise in your end towards it as well. And I think all of that makes this a little different this time around, I think is what I'm getting. Yeah. At. That's exactly what it was. And then I think also for me, it was um, when you're starting something on your own, you now start realizing it's not just about starting a business and making money from the business. It can be. There's no problem with that. Kudos to every, uh, people who are able to do that. But I think now, once I started, I started thinking about who I'd want to work with and what kind of business I would want my business to be. Um, is there a way that I work where I can be more sustainable? Is there a way I work that can be you know, more environmentally friendly? Mm-hmm. Is there a way that Sip Trip can figure out how we can be giving back 
Right. So when I started thinking that way, I was like, oh, this is not just just for a business or just for income. So I think it's also that thing about the type of business. Just because maybe you're born in an environment where people around you are entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily mean you'll be an entrepreneur in the same industry that they're in or in the exact same space, but yeah. you can find your own niche and be like, oh, okay, mm-hmm. maybe I can do this. And yeah. so for people who don't know, how does Sip Trip work exactly? What if I wanted to order a let's see, I wanted a, a nice smart of ice. Like a, oh, a nice cascabaridi. Yeah. Um, um, how would I then go about it? So currently we have our social media pages up and our website where you can see our products listed and there's way more products that I'm going to add in the coming weeks. Mm-hmm. Um but essentially, you go onto our website, which is www.siptripke.com, mm-hmm. and you can check the products, and then you call us. So the number is on there, mm-hmm. and you call us directly, and you order. I am working on a fully-fledged website where somebody can purchase online and do the M-Pesa transaction on there. It's mm-hmm. not yet up, but it will be up soon. Okay. So eventually, we will have just the online option where you don't even have to talk to anybody. And you can put in your address and it comes to you. But currently we're working with phone calls. Um, and what I loved in looking at the website was the variety. I, and I think you've mentioned this already, just the number of options that are there. Um, I, I really appreciate. Do you think that's one of your sort of unique selling points? I do think so. Um, but I will be lying if I said that we have the biggest okay. um, like inventory we don't have the biggest variety of drinks yet i'm working for us getting there but yes for us having variety of drinks is really important i think also what i'm going to try and do is make sip trip a place that you can get special or unique brands um of alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks and i am hoping to branch out as well Mm -hmm. to um Items listed that aren't necessarily drinks, but that will mostly come towards the end of this year and beginning of next year. And so for this pivot that you made, was there much investment that had to go into it? An investment can be money, it can be time. So I think one thing that actually saved me not having to invest as much money at the beginning was me, my mom, my brother, um, my boyfriend, my dad, us coming together and figuring out okay, what can each of us do just to make this process as smooth as possible at the beginning mm-hmm. before we even brought in any of our team members from the restaurant. So one of the things that we did earlier on with my mom when we were planning it and we got the name was we were like, okay, you're going to do this and this. You're going to set up social media and you're going to run that and I'll be on your phone. Mm-hmm. You're going to go get the right that you'll be coordinating that with him. You also negotiate the pricing. This is what we have in mind. Like that, like that. So everybody had a task. Um, of course, the biggest, biggest money saver was that we had the stocks. Yes. So now it's just a question of figuring out how you separate that inventory of Siptrip and Jueke and Bourbon, just because that's also a whole other, just an Excel sheet mess mm-hmm. if you don't do it at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, biggest, biggest, biggest cost saver was we had the stocks. What did you, what, what was success for you in starting this? Was it just moving the stock? Success was just starting, babe, Paula, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> success was just starting and having a few orders every day. Like that, for me, the main thing, because also I realized if I had... 1,000 orders day one, the business would have crumbled. Every customer would have had a horrible experience Mm -hmm. and it would not have made any sense and no one would call us again. Mm -hmm. So it's starting off really slow and quiet has been such a blessing because I've learned so much and there's still so much more to learn. But I think for me, success is if I sold one today and then I sell two tomorrow, great. Then I sell none and then I sell three bottles, great. Like I'm just like, and if someone is calling me, telling me, oh, they, they just followed me on social media or they just heard of me from their neighbor or their sibling, I'm like, yes. Yeah. So right now, I'm just trying to get as many people to know the brand, like it's Sip Trip. Mm-hmm. We bring drinks to your doorstep and just having people have that conversation, you know, save our number, just know who we are. For me, currently, that's the most of success. Right. And I'm glad you said that because I wanted to ask how you're marketing yourself and how you're finding new customers with your business at this point in time. Um, How are you connecting with new customers? 
So we did something very interesting. I um, mean, we are still doing it, actually. Mm-hmm. I kind of went back to like my year 11 business studies book. Yes. And when we first, first opened, I was actually doing cold calls. I just went on my contact list and thought of all the friends and all the family, former colleagues, current colleagues who I think would order from us. Mm-hmm. And I would just call them. Every day I had like 10 people on call. Just be like, hi, I've opened this business. And sometimes I would just message like on WhatsApp groups because on WhatsApp groups, that's easier than the post and things. But I would actually do individual calls to former bosses, my, CV, my, my friends, my aunties and uncles and family friends. And I just be like, yeah, we start, I, I have started this business. Would you like support? We do this, we do this. I know you probably do get drinks delivered to the house. So maybe now you can just do it through us. And that actually worked pretty well at the beginning with awareness. We do have our social media pages, Sip Trip KE, but I wasn't even as active on there when I saw the response of the direct calls and texts. Mm -hmm. Because even when I send texts to a WhatsApp group, it's still a bit like, oh yeah, we've seen, they're aware, Mm -hmm. but it wouldn't direct to sales as much as when I talk to somebody one-on-one. I had been reading that to this day, I think it's, what do they call it? Email, like email subscriptions um, still give businesses more sales than texts than calls and social media. And I was like, what? Mm. That is wild. So when I read that, I was like, okay, let me think of direct communication and something that would work for me right now. And I also thought about it as when you start a business initially, it is you. Mm. So maybe some people will buy just because it's you. Mm. Because when it comes with alcoholic brands and beverages, all these beverages exist. Right. Somebody somewhere has them. Somebody somewhere is selling it, either from a supermarket or a wine spirit or in a restaurant. So what you're selling isn't different or unique. Mm-hmm. What I found interesting was when I called people and texted them and talked to them directly, despite the relationship we had, I actually had it translating to sales more. I don't know the exact science behind it. I just read a few articles and I tried it and it worked for me. You know, because they do say that your first quote unquote customers will always be your inner circle or whatever your circle is, right? But I do, I like that sort of quote unquote tip at this point that you've given us in terms of just like get on the, it's cold calling. It's (sighs) cold calling. (laughs) It's not. It's honestly not. It's not fun because you literally have a script. After a while, everyone you call is asked the exact same thing. But when I saw the translation of it in my business, I was like, wow, yeah. this actually works. And then the phone call started becoming not so repetitive. Yeah. And I could be able to even gauge. You start becoming better at it. You're yeah. able to tell where somebody's at when you call them, whether they're able to talk. You're able to tell somebody who just needs a text first, maybe before you have a phone call. So you kind of learn as you go. Mm-hmm. But I will also give another tip to anybody listening. Um, don't be shy. Because at first I felt kind of weird. It is When weird. I was sending the me. messages, I'd feel like, oh, I haven't talked to this person in a while. So that's awkward. Yeah. I'm asking this person you know, to buy for me. Or oh, I know this person quit drinking. But you could talk to them about the non-alcoholic drinks. Like you're just feeling weird. Or oh, the last time I saw this person, it was strange. Or there was a fight. Let me tell you something. Don't be shy. Like, that's something that hit me hard. I was really shocked. Like, but that will stop you from achieving a lot of things. You will not get sales just because you're shy or you're worried to talk to somebody or you feel you have to really lay some foundation on the ground. Say hello, yes. Ask the person how they're doing. Everyone loves that question, but they're usually more concerned about their answer than they, you ask it. No, I think it's, it really comes down to closed mouths don't get fed. So how, oh, yes, exactly. and you get to practice because essentially you were, I don't know how many calls you ended up doing, but you're, each time you're pitching the business and you get better. Yeah, I should actually, I should actually count them. But yeah, it's, it's, you're right. It's practice. Like I said, you start being able to tell. Yeah, where the person is at when you call them and whether it's the right time to have the conversation or how you should approach. I like that you set, up, you set up 10 per day that you just had to check off and then you just did it daily. Yeah, and I would share. If I felt that um, my brother would be better off talking at that, to that person than I would, mm-hmm. I would send the number and I'd push. I'd be like, hey, please call this person. I think they'd order. And then you send a text and you're like, did you call them? Did you call them? Like, you know, do it. <laughs> and by same thing with my dad, with my mom, you know, like we know that we all have our misconceptions and judgments. Yeah. When the African says, I can't call my father's friends 
and yes. tell them I'm selling alcohol and I will send to their homes. Mm-hmm. But if my father calls them and tells them, then they now call me. Once they order from there, we will be working directly together. Mm-hmm. I like that. But yeah. sometimes that initial step needs to be taken by somebody else. So if you know somebody has misconceptions, you know somebody is an ageist or doesn't want to talk to you because you're young or you're a girl, that's I mean, you have to lose their sale. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So people will have their biases. Maybe they're worried because it's new or they're worried because it's you or they don't think, whatever it is. If you know there's a way around getting to that person or you're just not the right person to market your business to them, get the right person to market, the sale is still yours. Mm-hmm. Great. And, you know, <laughs> it's in- this is somebody who's been in business for like a few weeks. Eh? So take no. everything I say with a pinch of salt. <laughs> no, no, because I think, I do think you, girl, you're sharing uh, tips and the things you bring with both your econ background and your comms slash media background yeah. to it yeah. because because uh, I've, I've known people who have interviewed and this tip I've never heard. So, you know, oh, cool. you, just, you just, I never think, oh, one year, two year. For me, I think what stood out to me is the pivot is smart, you guys were really smart about how looking at what you have and saying, right. how can we keep going? How do we adjust? Because pivoting is hard work. It's an agility. It's saying we can do more. Because really, you guys could have just waited out. The, That's this, true. This um, thing's opening up. But you know, how do you, how do you make lemonade out of lemons? And for me, this is really fascinating because this is very much the type of lemonade that we're not really seeing out there a lot, which I appreciate completely. I think the pivot happened as, as well as maybe it did because we all work together. So it's all one family, but we all have different views and we all have different business styles and we're different ages. So I think that's kind of what helped us pivot well. And you, you, you do have competitors. I can think of two, two competitors, which I will not name. Um, and so- I have so much more than two, girl. I have yeah. like, they, that was another thing that was really fun for us when we figured it out, when we started doing this. Yeah. Um, it came up when we were thinking about the name Sip Trip. Mm-hmm. So when we were thinking about the name, of course, we had to look at all the names out there just double check with the ones that we knew and we discovered so many more <laughs> one um so many more delivery services um yeah. for drinks and for other things that we didn't know about and we're like oh, okay um yeah. but it's okay it's it's not a reason to be scared or to think you need to come in so hard for competition i think it just comes down to um there's enough for everyone if that makes sense mm-hmm yeah. There, there is enough drinks delivery companies to serve the whole of Kenya. So there's no need for us to try and all, you know, kill and destroy each other. It's enough. It's mm-hmm. fine. So you come from a, a place of abundance. Like there's room for all of us. No one needs to, to kill the other or take down the other in order to thrive is what I'm hearing. Yeah, I think I learned that from my dad, actually, because what he, competition is there and it's good and do be competitive and you should challenge um, your, the people within your industry and always try to be number one. Like, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but I don't think, I think that sometimes people can end up doing a lot of things that are wrong in business practice, either they're tricking their customers or you're trying to find some kind of shortcut all in the name of competition and trying to get a bigger market share. But I think if you think in abundance, like you're saying, then you, you will always see other opportunities. Like you'll always see something else you're not doing in your business. It won't always be about cutting the competitor down. You'll always be looking within your business and be like, Oh, have I thought about my employees? Um, have I thought about my business growth? Have I thought about other things I'm not doing? Is there something else I'm not seeing? Is there another opportunity that's not there? Mm. it's not always about what everyone else is doing and being in their head, especially now um, with COVID-19. I had a conversation with somebody on my show that I do, which I think also <laughs> helps with my business because I tend to talk to life coaches and therapists quite a bit. Yes. And sometimes I feel like I get free coaching and therapy <laughs> while doing my, my job. Yeah. But he talked about competition right now and during the time of COVID-19 and he was emphasizing how he doesn't think this is actually the time to compete. Mm. Some people are like, oh my God, it's a chance. It's an opportunity. You know, this is a chance to 
take as much market share as possible. But he was like, he doesn't think that that's the case. He was like, this is the time to look at your business as your business. You do an audit of your business. What are the holes in your business that you don't see? What are the opportunities? even with your employees that you don't see, maybe talents and gifts that are there that you're not looking at. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was like being really, really, really competitive and focusing on what your competitors are doing right now, you could actually end up losing. Mm-hmm. No, it's um, literally mind your own business, literally. But it's hard to do, though. It's hard to do, but it's possible. And I think there's even other things to mind. You see, what we've learned now is if we had been focused on how can our businesses run without us, if we had been focused on does my business have to be in a physical space to work, Mm -hmm. if we had focused, you know, on there's a lot of businesses right now that wouldn't be closing Mm -hmm. or maybe would have just been better prepared. Mm -hmm. If we spent less time worrying about what our competitors are doing or my customer bought from this person instead of me. And uh, if you had just looked at your business and been like, where does this business lack this mm-hmm. and this and this and how can I improve it? Then most likely you would have been better prepared for a situation in which your business would have to adapt to yeah. a totally different environment. And so what are some of these new skills you've had to pick up very quickly <laughs> in order to, and I, sometimes it's hard to tell what you've learned yeah doing the work and uh, but are there things where you're like i have to quickly learn how to i don't know work logistics or i don't know i had to quickly learn how to be untrusting actually because i got conned by a customer like in week two <laughs> somebody ordered their drinks and the delivery went to them before the Empresa message had come in but I was feeling trusting and then they acted very odd when my delivery person arrived they just couldn't be traced then we traced them and they were very nice and polite but they were saying that they can't come down to collect the goods and the person needs to come up or doesn't or they are sending someone they took forever then they sent somebody the person collected the drinks. Now, the, my, my delivery person who was giving the drinks didn't check in with whether the message had finally arrived. But because they had been waited for so long, they just assumed. Mm, that had come. They handed over the drink. Yes. And now they were coming back. And we were just like, oh, wow. Like, that person has just gone to drinks and they didn't pay. Um, and I was busy focused on something else and trying to push another sale. So I, I realized that I have to have protocol. Mm. There has to be an order of how things are done. It doesn't matter even if I want to say this is a new, new business in 2020. No, if it is order, pay, dispatch, receive, that is how it will work. Mm-hmm. There will not be another style, you know, or something. Um, another thing that I think I picked up as a skill is also patience. Mm-hmm. It's very, very excited at the beginning and I wasn't the only one, so was my family. Extremely, extremely excited, super pumped, not realizing there were so many kinks we hadn't worked out, but also not realizing that people would be happy to hear about us, but would take that time before they support us outright. And so uh, one of my questions had been, were you going to continue with trip after COVID? Because I, I wasn't sure yes. if this was just a... a yes, um, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> my answer is yes. <laughs> I right. have very big dreams for trip and myself currently. Okay. Um, so I'm definitely, definitely continuing the business um, post-COVID. Yeah. I think I'm very excited for how it will grow and develop. I, I was having a conversation yesterday with my friend and they were like, Susan, don't make a plan, make a vision. Because plans, you'll be disappointed. But if you make a vision, it can change, it can alter, and it will grow with you. And I was like, hmm, mm. I like it. So I have a very big vision for Sick Trip and I 100% will be here post-COVID, okay? Excellent. And we'd love to hear it. Um, and can I ask what you've learned about yourself in starting this business? Mm, I'm terrible with time management, one. <laughs> I thought I was good before. I was like, oh, I'm a firstborn. You know, I have these jobs. I'm always on time. So, or at least I'm usually on time if I'm not, oh, like I'm, Within the time I was there, you know, mm-hmm. so I was like, can't be that bad. Um, but I realized time management, like in what it means, time management, not being on time, the two different things. Mm-hmm. So I learned I'm bad, I'm bad at time management. I can be good at being on time, but I'm t- <laughs> managing my time and figuring out when I need to do what and stopping. I think, um, there is 
what is urgent and what is important. And they always say you should always try and do what is important. Sometimes don't always focus on what is urgent. Mm-hmm. And I'm so bad at that. I'm really trying to practice and learn and prioritize correctly. Um, positive thing that I learned about myself was that I am ambitious, more ambitious than I thought I was. Mm. Um, because when me and my mom were discussing the plan originally, it could easily have just become part of the family business umbrella. And I could have helped her with the idea and set up and then hand it over to another team, Mm -hmm. you know. But I just felt so strongly, no, I want to do this. No, no, this is not someone else's. This is mine. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And yeah, that just showed me that I was actually way more ambitious than I thought I was. And can I add the time management thing? It takes a while to figure out. And for me... Oh, so I just accept. (laughs) No, you'll figure it out. It will be a journey. journey. Yeah, the business will force you to figure it out. Like there'll be things you cannot do until you figure this out. But for me, one of the biggest lessons with time management was learning to say no to things. Because in order to get Uh, to the urgent things and the important things, I had to say no to other things but it will come in its own time and so this segment is called I know what I'm doing and I'm asking my guests to just talk about something they're really 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 good at right and something (laughs) that you know they they're like a superstar in getting done and so for you if I was to ask you uh Susan what do you know Mm -hmm. doing what would your answer be my answer would be talk (laughs) but um in more detail i'd probably say um interviewing and emceeing but emceeing is so fun and it's like i think for me i'd say i know it pretty well is because i was doing it before i knew i was doing it okay what do you mean by that remember this once my really good friend sylvia i think it was her 18th birthday and at her 18th birthday, when the DJ was playing like Mohidi music or <laughs> any kind of hype, local jams, um, Sylvia actually like came and got me and we went and we're jamming together. And then she's like, Susan, take the microphone, you know, do your thing. Mm-hmm. And it was just so much fun to get the cry- crowd all hyped up and to get everyone in the same physical space in the same mental space or emotional space as well is really fun especially if you're celebrating something it's something to be happy about mm-hmm. yeah so what do you think it takes to be a good MC? number one thing and it's actually something that i'm trying to get better at is you need to be good at listening because if you can listen or read a room then you're able to tell where people are at mm. and therefore you're able to take them on the journey you want them to go on during the event or during the interview but then I also think that you need to be somebody who likes to see people happy. So if you're somebody who likes seeing people happy and excited, I, I think you'd probably be a pretty good MC because you'd work hard to figure out how to get them in that space, in the emotional space you want them for for the event. And I think the ability to make people happy or to bring joy yeah. into their space, that's, that's magic. That's not even a skill set. I think that's magic. <laughs> Yeah, so it's those two. And the third one I would say is also um, practice. So just like any other skill, if you want to be into emceeing and um, all of that, you really, really have to practice. Now, practicing sounds weird if you don't have any gigs to go to to practice your emceeing skills. Mm-hmm. But practice is watching other emcees. Um, practicing is actually standing in front of a mirror and talking through your plan for the event and the program um i usually practice in front of a person okay so you somebody but if you're feeling shy or you feel like it's not really prepped yet or you want to hear what it sounds like because sometimes i feel like if you're truly truly honest yeah with yourself you know when something is good and you know when something can be better everyone knows when you get out of an exam room you usually know whether you pass or fail. You might not be able to guess the exact mark that you got, but you have a feeling. So usually the reason I'd say stand in front of a mirror and practice for key things, if it's maybe uh, a joke or it's uh, your own naked objective eye, because you know yourself and your potential, Mm -hmm. you will be able to tell when you're getting better, you can be able to tell that this doesn't sound quite right. And then after that, now I would say practice in front of somebody. 
do not let that somebody be your mother. We all know all our mothers tell us we're great. <laughs> yes. If you have an objective mother, fine. But there are few and far in between. So just <laughs> practice in front of somebody who you believe will tell you the truth and watch other MCs as well because you can practice by watching. Wow, you guys know I love a good tip and this is a really good tip because you can actually use it in real life, not just if you are an MC. If you have a big presentation, practice in front of a mirror or a friend. And if you really wanna get into the nitty gritty of feedback, actually video record your presentation or interview and play it back critically for feedback. Now, wasn't Susan amazing? Since the interview happened back in May, I asked Susan for some updates to share with you. She said she has been working on growing her customer base, building more efficient processes, offering affordable options, as well as signing on more brands to SipTrip. So look out for the expansion of their products over the next few weeks as they'll be bringing more wine and more gin on board. If you remember your first year of business, send Susan your prayers and luck. It ain't easy starting something new, especially in the time of COVID. Susan, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Next week, we leave Kenya for our next interview. I can't wait to share. So be it, see to it, talk to you soon. 